Hello, Internets. So let's say you've realized that much of the establishment media we all see on cable TV is fairly untrustworthy and of pathetically poor quality. Fortunately, the majority agrees with you to some extent and understands that mainstream news is, at the very least, not to be taken at face value. This is shown by Gallup polls from late 2021 in the USA that people who have a fair amount of trust in the mainstream media is only 36% and slowly declining, as these publications seem to be more interested in doubling down on their propaganda rather than improving or adopting any respectable sense of journalistic integrity. But this can often lead to a hard question. If the media is so full of crap, how do you know what is true and what is not? From this question, many people find themselves revisiting the world of conspiracy theories, which is the topic of today's video. Chasing random rabbit holes of non-mainstream sources, and while some of them are fairly responsible, others often just spew completely unsubstantiated irrational garbage that can easily be even worse than the garbage the mainstream media is selling. This has unfortunately led a lot of people falling for some really stupid shit. So in this video, I'm going to share a rationalist approach to separate the wheat from the chaff by comparing conspiracy theories that later turned out to be true to conspiracy theories that have remained completely baseless for years on end. There are tests of reason you can use to tell the difference between which non-mainstream ideas might actually be genuine red pills that possess some truth to them, and which are likely the deranged ramblings of some schizos who have absolutely no idea what they are talking about. I'll first start with the number of co-conspirators. So let's say the government is paying a group of 10 scientists to conduct some top secret research that involves some, we'll just say, questionable ethics, and leave it at that. Now here's a question. What are the chances one of these people has a morality attack and decides to leak evidence of this unethical research? Now how about if there are 100 researchers, or how about 1,000? 10,000? 100,000? If you think about it, all it really takes is one dedicated person, or a co-conspirator, to decide to gather all the data and evidence they have access to in order to publish it, or in other words, become a whistleblower. So as the number of co-conspirators increases, so do the chances of damning evidence managing to find its way to the public. In other words, the more people who know about a secret, the harder it is to keep that secret. Pretty straightforward and rational, really. This is actually something that a physicist slash biologist by the name of David Grimes looked into. He looked at the number of co-conspirators in various conspiracy theories that turned out to be true, and found out that once you get past a few hundred, a leak should eventually happen. If the number of people who would need to have insider access to a conspiracy in order for it to properly function is ridiculously high, it would stand to reason that the chances of the truth eventually making its way to the public is also very high. Take Edward Snowden, for example. In case anyone forgot, Edward Snowden was the man who leaked the NSA civilian spying scandal to the public. The basis gist of it is that the NSA is involved in a massive global surveillance program that spies on citizens and violates our privacy rights without any kind of due process, and that the government utilizes various hacking tools to do this. In other words, the state is using digital technology to spy on us. Snowden was involved with this project and found it to be immoral, and thus leaked what was happening to the public. According to Grimes, the leak from Snowden can be seen as an inevitability rather than a freak accident. His idea brings to the light the possibility that someone eventually would have come forward as just a matter of time. While Grimes' formula is extremely conservative in its estimates, and based on only a small sample size due to there not being enough data to work with, the basic reasoning behind it is fairly valid. It's very unlikely that vast conspiracies with insane numbers of co-conspirators can remain in the dark for long, for the simple reason that human beings are what you can call predictably unpredictable, which means that humans are unpredictable often enough that you can be rest assured that someone in a group of people that are supposed to be following some set of rules or regulations will eventually do something that goes outside of said rules and regulations for whatever arbitrary reason they might have in the moment. While this rationale doesn't completely rule anything out 100%, it does mean you should be extremely skeptical of any conspiracy theory that requires, say, hundreds of thousands of people to be in on it and somehow no one breaks with the group and decides to spill the beans to the public. It's very unlikely. For example, one conspiracy theory that I have seen that I find particularly ridiculous is the space is fake conspiracy, or the idea that outer space isn't real and thus all space-based operations are somehow hoaxes. Before even getting into the various physics problems and scientific contradictions this belief requires you to have, just think of how many people would have to be involved to pull this off. Every single space agency from every single country would have to be involved. Every single private company that has launched satellites into space, or otherwise partakes in private spacefaring operations, would have to be involved. 
every company that relies on the data from satellites in outer space would have to be somehow pulling that data from elsewhere, which then opens up the entirely new conspiracy theory on top of this conspiracy theory, revolving around how certain technology that relies on satellites to work are somehow able to function anyways. Overall, millions of people would have to be involved in a global conspiracy of this level. That no one involved would leak anything substantial by now is so unfeasible and disconnected from reality that it's basically impossible, and thus the space is fake conspiracy, in my opinion, can be safely disregarded as nonsense based on the sheer scale of it alone, before even needing to look at the many other logical problems with this claim. The next method to consider is profits. Another straightforward way to rule out, or in some cases rule in, certain conspiracy theories is how they might affect the profits and well-being of the rich and powerful. If there's basically no real incentive to do something, or there's no real financial benefit, or in some cases actually causes financial strain or otherwise harms the power of the ruling elite, then there's a good chance a conspiracy theory is not true. Take things like global depopulation through poisoning the air by chemtrails, for example. The elite don't have any kind of way to prevent such a method from harming themselves as well. There is no real benefit to them because, as it turns out, they have to breathe the same atmosphere that we do. So if the ruling class really did want to depopulate the planet, they certainly wouldn't do it through a method that harms everyone equally, including themselves. No, they would find a way to profit off of people's deaths and use a method that they are somehow exempt from. You know, like unnecessary endless wars, for example. Those are very effective at grabbing extra power for the ruling class at the expense of millions of innocent lives. Hmm, perhaps we should question war propaganda more often. Poisoning the air, on the other hand, is quite possibly the stupidest thing they could do to accomplish that task. And for that reason alone, the chemtrails conspiracy theory, or at least the version of it that claims chemtrails are designed to exterminate us eventually, is probably not true. But of course, on the flip side, if a conspiracy would be extremely profitable, or in some ways highly beneficial to the ruling class, then this of course increases the chance that there may be some kind of truth to it. This is actually in a very common theme in conspiracy theories that are eventually proven to be true. If you have ever googled silly things like top 10 conspiracy theories that turned out to be correct, you might notice that the vast majority of them are something that benefits either the state or a large corporation in some way. For example, Big Tobacco had evidence that smoking is in fact quite unhealthy for you for quite some time before it was made public. Obviously, it's very lucrative to trick people into thinking that an addictive substance is healthy for them with no drawbacks, and then sell it to them. So it really came as no surprise when it was discovered that the tobacco industry knew of these problems and tried to hide it. Another good example would be the MK Ultra experiments. This is when the US government secretly conducted human experimentation to see if different combinations of drugs like LSD could be used to weaken a person's will and make them open to suggestion. Obviously a mind control drug would be a very powerful asset to the state that wishes to remain in power anyway, or even just to make a profit as the amount of money you could make with such a drug would be endless. So it should come as no surprise that the MK Ultra experiments were confirmed to be true. There's also media and state collusion, something very beneficial to the state, which of course is a conspiracy theory that has been proven true several times throughout history in several different countries. State propaganda will always be a useful tool of the ruling elites, and thus it comes as no surprise they keep pulling that grift over and over again. Basically, conspiracies that bring a strong financial or power-based incentive to partake in have a slightly higher chance of being true as opposed to just random crap that doesn't really seem to have any real reason for it to exist. Next up is sophistry in reporting. It's important to understand that even the mainstream media very rarely outright tells lies that are 100% untrue. They occasionally do, but usually they mix in lies and subjective opinions in with the truth by utilizing sophistry, which is the intentional use of incoherent, biased, or otherwise fallacious arguments with the intent to deceive. The term sophistry has history in ancient Greece, where a lot of teachers focused on rhetoric rather than solid objective reason, and Plato basically exposed them as being pseudo-intellectual midwits and liars. But unfortunately, intellectually dishonest rhetoric will always be useful for convincing normies, so sophistry is still very heavily employed by dishonest media outlets. For instance, if you are watching CNN, and the news anchor tells you that a small town in Kansas was hit by an F4 tornado the other day, chances are extremely high that an F4 tornado did indeed hit a small town in Kansas. So when it comes to falsifiable, observable events, the media, even for all of their problems, tends to be relatively reliable. However, if one of their pundits speaks up and claims that this tornado was due to climate change, that would be an example of sophistry. There is no scientifically accurate way to know for sure if a specific tornado would have happened without climate change, which means it would be an unfalsifiable statement. It would simply be an opinion thrown in to remind you that CNN 
allegedly cares about environmental issues, but otherwise has no basis in objective truth. Whether you believe in global warming or not, the fact is we don't actually have a way of knowing how a specific weather event was impacted by it. We can only guess. But that's again just a hypothetical example. A recent example of sophistry that actually happened would be the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Those of us with a good level of common sense were not surprised at all that Kyle Rittenhouse was ruled not guilty, as the media narrative surrounding Rittenhouse was pretty thoroughly debunked in the courthouse. Why was this not a surprise to us? Well, because there was significant video evidence proving his innocence. However, much of the media, most likely for partisan reasons, did not like this fact. So instead, they pulled every mental gymnastic move in the book and spewed a number of ridiculously fallacious arguments to imply that Kyle was in fact some kind of white supremacist mass shooter. Because sophistry is generally intentional, it's very easy for a journalist to leave out bits and pieces of information that do not agree with the biased narrative they are pushing. This is how millions of Americans were duped into believing that Rittenhouse was something that he is not. Or a more hilariously obvious example was when MSNBC tried to pull a completely bogus fact check on the Hillary Clinton email leak. Trump stated that Hillary Clinton acid washed her server. MSNBC tried to claim that this statement was false because she didn't literally use acid, but instead used a program. Which is of course absolutely ridiculous. Trump was obviously being hyperbolic, and MSNBC took advantage of that to take his statement literally for no real reason. So this is an obvious example of sophistry by deliberately misinterpreting the events they are reporting on. It's important to note that this is equally true for both mainstream media and the government. Washington DC, for example, regularly employs sophistry and official White House statements are often filled with ridiculous talking points. This is important to take note of when it comes to things like war. One of the particular kind of conspiracy theory that gets repeatedly proven true time and time again is that the state and the media often conspire to push sophistry and propaganda regarding reasons to drag us into war that later turn out to be half-truths at best, often outright fabrications at worst. MRH Legacy recently did a very good video on this, but also a very long video on this in regard to the War on Terror. I'll leak it at the end in case anyone is interested in going on a binge. Spotting sophistry is something that does take some skill, and studying of critical thinking to master as propagandists can be very tricky, but it is worth practicing because learning to de identify sophistry is extremely useful for determining truth. If everything primetime news is telling us in regards to a certain event is filled to the brim with logical errors and incoherent subjective opinions with very few verifiable facts, then there is a good chance that the exact opposite of what they are saying is true. Because if a narrative really was true, then sophistry to push propaganda in favor of that narrative would be unnecessary. Necessary. This isn't always the case, as you don't want to fall for a fallacy fallacy where you're assuming something is false just because it was poorly reasoned. The media does occasionally make honest mistakes, but most of the time it's intentional propaganda, so this is a pretty solid way to spot nonsense. Next is the Gish Gallop. For those who do not know, the Gish Gallop is a dishonest debate tactic where someone continues to make so many absurd arguments that their opponent has no way to refute them all in time. A Gish Galloper will make maybe a hundred ridiculous arguments for a position they are defending, and then because their opponent only has time to refute half of those arguments, the Galloper will then falsely claim victory because not all of their arguments for their position were refuted. The reason this is so deceptive is because it often takes longer to refute a stupid argument than it does to make the stupid argument. For instance, if someone claims that a research study supports their position, when in fact it does not support their position at all, it takes a lot longer to read through that study and explain why they are wrong than it does for someone to make baseless claims about it. You have to, to meticulously go through the entire collection of papers to fully explain why this research doesn't actually prove their point, while all they have to do is lie and claim the papers do prove their position, which can be done in a single sentence. This same tactic can be found outside of debates and in conspiracy theories. If the people who believe in a certain conspiracy are constantly making up ridiculous, unsubstantiated claims, having their claims shot down by people well-versed in spotting BS, and then they just proceed to make up new BS claims for every claim that gets refuted, this is a good sign that the theory is bogus. People who continue to support an idea when everything in support of that idea is repeatedly refuted in extreme detail are generally out of touch with reality. A solid example of this is the Flat Earth Society. Flat Earther arguments are constantly being refuted by people from all angles of the political spectrum. Right-wingers are constantly refuting Flat Earthers, leftists are constantly refuting Flat Earthers, and of course libertarians are constantly refuting Flat Earthers. This is because Flat Earthers, for whatever reason, like to stick their newses in every single community that they can. The problem here is that people in the FES will 
usually make up multiple absurd reasons on the spot to hand wave away problems with their theory that the Earth is flat. For instance, I once pointed out to a flat earther that there would be multiple places on Earth where you can drive towards a mountain that is visible from over 50 miles away. Instead of slowly getting bigger, like you would expect if the surface level was completely flat, the mountains instead appeared to grow out from the ground, implying surface curvature. The flat earther responded to my argument by claiming that the government has set up holographic technology around Earth to create this illusion. He could not explain how this technology worked or provide any evidence that it existed. He legitimately just made it up on the spot. Conspiracy theory that might actually have truth to it doesn't need to be constantly reinventing itself and performing mental gymnastics to justify its continued existence. Which brings us right to the next method for judging conspiracies. Occam's Razor. For those who don't know, Occam's Razor is the concept that the most rational explanation that requires the fewest assumptions is usually true. It's important to understand that Occam's Razor isn't a 100% foolproof method, but we know from history that it is usually right simply because when it comes to assumptions, you want to cut back on them as much as possible since any one of them can be proven to be untrue. And thus, the fewer assumptions that need to be made generally correlates to a higher chance of an explanation being correct. For instance, this is why you should always take any conspiracy theory that requires belief in some esoteric supernatural mumbo-jumbo with a grain of salt. If one explanation for an event requires you to assume that George Bush likes money, and another explanation for the same event requires you to assume that George Bush is a Satanist with necromantic magic powers and has tapped into the Demiurge's reality marble to manipulate space-time for the coming Neo-Martian War, the explanation involving money is probably more likely to be true. The point I am making here is you should always consider if there is a far more rational explanation for a phenomenon that requires fewer assertions. One particular favorite I see amongst the bit shoot conspiracy theorists is the reptilian conspiracy theory that states that many, if not all, members of the political and social elite class are actually members of an alien reptilian race which has conquered Earth and now operates in secret by shapeshifting into humans. The problem I have with the reptilian conspiracy that the proof they have for it lies almost entirely in footage that allegedly shows people shapeshifting on live TV. The thing is, if you look to this footage and have any knowledge at all of digital artifacts and video encoding, you know that effects like this happen by accident all the time while processing digital media. Heck, they happen in my videos all the time. YouTube's processing often results in some of my backgrounds glitching out with the same brick artifacts that these people claim prove reptilians. It's one of the reasons I actually switched my main background animation recently because it was annoying me and I got tired of it. These artifacts can also appear when your TV fails to properly get a signal from the antenna or satellite due to the weather or something. The point is, encoding artifacts are an extremely far more likely explanation for this kind of so-called evidence than shape-shifting aliens. Now on the flip side, Occam's razor can also be one of the best tools for determining if a conspiracy theory could be true. If the most reasonable explanation that requires the fewest assumptions actually does conclude that a conspiracy could be happening, then it could very well be happening. A good example of this was Volt 7. If someone told you that the CIA has developed various hacking tools that are deliberately designed to fabricate or destroy digital evidence in their favor, does this sound like something the CIA would conspire to do? Are there any unreasonable assumptions that need to be made to believe the CIA might be engaged in such activities? Not really. Would you be surprised at all if this theory is true? I sure wasn't. This was all confirmed true on March 2017 when WikiLeaks started dumping leaked cable documents on it. Vault 7 is an absolutely massive leak, with tools for injecting data into just about anything and everything you can imagine from PCs to tablets to smartphones to even smart TVs. I may one day make a video that goes more in depth into that subject, but for now the point is that Volt 7 really shouldn't have come as a surprise to anyone to that it was true. It requires very few assumptions to believe that the CIA would do something like this, and it offers a very simple explanation for a large number of their activities in the last 25 years or so. So using Occam's Razor, you can pretty easily guess that this was happening even without the WikiLeaks dump that proved it. Anyways, I've saved the most controversial method for judging conspiracy theories for last, the grifter duck test, but it's also one of the most important methods. Just like anything else, when it comes to conspiracy theories, if it looks like a scam, feels like a scam, and the people pushing it talk like scammers, it's probably a scam. A very straightforward way to sniff out a conspiracy theory that has no basis in reality is if the source of the conspiracy is trying to sell you something that's insane. The more ridiculous their item is or service that they are trying to sell, the more likely that you are dealing with a grifter, or in other words, a con artist. For a specific example, there's an unfortunate trend I have noticed that really needs to be called out as it is regularly leading people into the deepest end of insanity imaginable, and that is the phenomena of the bit shoot conspiracy theorist Q Grifter. Now I'm not going to be so mean as to dunk on all of these guys as some of them genuinely seem to believe that what they are selling even if it's nonsense, but there's a specific pattern you really need to watch out for. 
One, they will make outlandish claims that imply they have some kind of insider knowledge, when in reality they are just copying whatever the latest Q research stuff is from 8 Coon. Basically, they will pretend to have access to extremely incriminating data that they don't actually have, and is in reality based on some shaky interpretation of a cryptic QAnon post from years ago. Two, they will try to pander to conservatives by making various right-wing talking points and mixing in nuggets of truth with their overall message. Don't fall for it. Three, trust the plan, patriots in charge. Do nothing, remain passive. The Russian monarchy will be reinstated any day now, two more weeks. And step four, please donate to the cause and buy their holistic meds or whatever ludicrous snake oil they are selling. What I'm basically saying here is to be aware of false messiahs. The false messiah works his magic by telling you what you want to hear. To just trust him and everything will be alright. That he's here to save the world and you and everyone just believe what he's selling. The key factor that all these grifters share is that they claim to have the goods, but then they never produce them. A genuine leaker like Edward Snowden or Julian Assange will strike like a viper and release the goods at the perfect moment in full before the guilty party has a chance to react. But the false messiah, on the other hand, will instead provide you with excuses for why he totally for reals has the goods, but he can't really quite release them yet. He needs, for whatever reason, to wait for two more weeks. And for you to buy his special brain vitamins. Or whatever. Okay, seriously though, a simple defense against false messiahs is to adopt the mantra, put up or shut up. These people need to be told to either substantiate their claims or bugger off. Conspiracy theories can be interesting, entertaining, and occasionally once in a blue moon turn out to be true. So it's not good to completely 100% disregard them. But it's always better when a more rationalist and objective approach to them is taken so you aren't just blindly believing whatever the latest internet fad is. It's important to question the state and the mainstream media and be aware of the false narratives that they push, but along the way we need to make sure we don't find ourselves getting tricked into following every single little white rabbit only to find ourselves on Mr. Bone's wild ride. Anyways, that's all I have to say in regards to conspiracy theories. If you liked the video, feel free to share, like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter and all that. That's all for now. Till next time.